Great. Thank you very much um, for sticking with us for this long. Um, we are going to use this discussion to try and pull together some of the threads uh, over the last couple of days from political polarization and populism to war, climate change, the challenge posed by AI. The title for this um, session comes from an article by George Soros, um, Can Democracy Survive the Poly Crisis? He was hoping to be with us uh, now and to be part of this discussion. But um, what I would like to do is to, to use this discussion to bring in as many council members as possible. We have a, a brilliant um, uh, person to, to kick off uh, the debate and to, to try and help us draw some of these threads together. But we're hoping that this will be a very interactive session and that many of you will, will speak, will uh, make comments, ask questions, uh, and help us kind of understand this moment. The, the word at the heart of this panel is one which um, Adam Tooze has done more than anyone uh, else to, to popularize uh, the idea of the of the poly crisis. Adam uh, has just joined ECFR's board, so we're very happy to have you here at your first um, uh, council meeting. Um, uh, but uh, it, it's a, a term which has taken on a mimetic quality, and we've seen lots of people in all sorts of different contexts talking about the, the poly crisis. So maybe we can just start with a, a, a very basic foundational question, like what is the poly crisis and, and why is it helpful for us to understand the current moment? Thank you, Mark, and it is indeed a great pleasure to be here and to be joining ECFR, which I've been following for a long time as a as a as a board member. Um, and I have to say, I'm still very much under the impact of that last session um, and asking myself this question. Actually, uh, what, in light of the ongoing conflict and the intensity of the debate that is generated there? does a concept like this have to contribute when what we need to be talking about is the war? I think maybe one way of beginning to bridge the gap, as I struggle to do that, I, I, I mean this not simply as a rhetorical hook, is that perhaps one of the spaces in which polycrisis has been least salient is the security policy dis, uh, discourse. Um, because I think maybe the security policy discourse has its own logic, always has, and on the other hand, it has its own term. And listening, I thought maybe hybridity is actually the way to connect. You could also call our world a world beset by hybrid crisis in the sense that hybridity very nicely captures the, the disjoint, right? That extraordinary passage where, where the minister from Moldova was talking about the way in which you can't very well organize your EU policy when the Russians have just knocked out the Ukrainian power station. Well, that's a polycrisis condition. And I think polycrisis might be the way it might be best thought of as a term through which the other side of the global policy conversation, the folks who are more interested perhaps in climate, in economic policy, are uh, fulfilling Ulrika Franca's mandate to, as it were, incorporate the site and vendor every day, right? It's a way of, way of forcing ourselves to confront this. It's not by accident, I think, that George Soros, Martin Wolf, Larry Summers are the folks who've picked up this idea and run with it most actively because we come from the side which in the 90s thought we had an answer, which was the economy stupid. And then another way I think of thinking about the polycrisis notion is it's a way of dealing with the fallout from the fact that that is no longer a convincing answer to anyone, even if you do come, like Larry Summers or Martin Wolf or myself, from the side of political economy. We are forcing ourselves to deal with hybridity too. And that, I think, is the core idea about the polycrisis, right, is that it is the recognition of the fact that we are dealing with irreducibly different, irreducibly hybrid threats which require you simultaneously, when you are doing monetary policy, for instance, or designing a climate investment program, to deal with the implications of a pandemic shock or a democratic derailment, which showed up in the Fed's calculation of investment risk and uncertainty when we were dealing in the Trump era, or a war. And that does not easily reduce to the old frame that says it's the economy stupid. So I think of polycrisis <laughs> and this has been one for me of the learnings of this meeting, the confrontation between the security policy side, which you engineer so well here, and the other dimensions of policy. I think of polycrisis as sitting in that space. It's our way of recognizing this. And I didn't invent this term. It came from 
I, I've, I've discovered it in the work essentially of Jean-Claude Juncker, who used it repeatedly in the period between 1415 and 16 to describe the confluence at that moment of the Greek debt crisis, the refugee crisis, the upsurge in populism, and of course, Ukraine won, 1.0, the struggle of the EU to craft a policy in response to the war then. So I think th that's what this term, that's the work this term is doing. I have very little investment personally in its currency, but I think it registers it registers this, this combined hybrid disturbing shock. I think you could take another way and say that it is another way of recognizing the end of the end of history. So we were both together at Davos earlier in the year and, and there was a, an interesting discussion about the notion of the polycrisis and another uh, distinguished historian, Neil Ferguson, was very kind of skeptical about the the idea of the polycrisis, he said to, to, he said, you know, what's the difference between a polycrisis and, and just kind of history stuff happening in cycles? There have always been kind of crises going on in different ways. Um, we were just recording a podcast about this, but I, I think it would be important before we kind of open it up to, to talk about what is the difference between a polycrisis and history? What is so special about what's happening on, at, the, at the moment? It's not just one thing happening after another in the sort of classical way. I mean, it's crucial to, to weigh the, the weight of this um, because the term, I think, carries a huge weight. Because if we say that we're facing the end of the end of history, what, it is, what is it exactly that we think has come back? When we say that we are out of the end of the end of history, what is it that we actually mean when we say history is back? And I think you could sort of shrug and say, well, we mean violence and chaos and disorder. But the question is, how on earth can we calmly contemplate that fact without essentially sliding into a kind of cynicism? And if I have a critique of Neil, it would be that his sort of conservatism lends itself to a kind of cynicism, which as a liberal, a kind of increasingly disillusioned and worried liberal, I find very difficult to deal with, actually. So I think if it is true that history is coming back, and even if it were just the old history, it should give us no cause to sleep, right? We would, we would be robbed of our sleep. Because if you think of what Europe's history is, if we think of that coming back, it should give us the extraordinary urgency that we felt from the, the Ukrainian deputy prime minister, which is, folks, it's a literally life and death every single minute from here on out until we have established hard boundaries. There is no sleep for us now. Now, if you mean that by saying history is back, and that's all it is, Adam, this whole polycrisis notion is just history, well, then fair enough, we're in the same, we're, in, we're talking for real. That's, I think, a reasonable discourse. I think the concern could be that what polycrisis actually registers is something even more dramatic than that, which I find odd, I, I'm somewhat uncomfortable as a professional historian even saying this, but that we could actually be living in a period of unprecedented challenge and disruption. And I think that is really quite difficult for many of us to contemplate as a possibility, even when faced with changes as daunting as climate change or the confrontation between the United States and China, we tend rather instinctively to read them back onto something else like World War I with technology, for instance, or 1914. But just for a second, think about this. There has never before in history been a state as populous and as powerful as the People's Republic of China. Never before in history 1.4 billion people organized in a massively powerful nation state. We subsume that within the category of European nation states at our peril. And certainly never before in history has there been a state rising, facing an incumbent, as filled with missionary zeal and clarity about its exceptional historical mission and power and potency as the United States. So if you want to say, well, it's just a recurrence of great power politics, well, good luck to you, because that's not actually what it looks like by any reasonable historical metric. Well, think about the climate crisis. There's one bit of us which I think has adjusted to the reality that we are actually living through something totally unprecedented. How else could you think about the likely, I think now inevitable prospect that the polar ice caps will melt, possibly within our lifetimes? That, after all, is an unprecedented reality. And then we say we're going to do the energy transition. But as soon as you say the energy transition, you begin to think of something familiar, like when cars replaced horses and buggies. And I will get from sophisticated audience after another, somebody asking me the question, so Adam, what is the historical precedent for the energy transition? Is it going to be like when we got railways? And the simple answer is no, there is simply no precedent for what we're doing, either in the scale or the ambition or the deliberateness. You cannot simultaneously believe in 
the climate crisis as we recognize it and expect historical precedents to bear on our reality. It's a contradictory position. And, and if you're willing to say history is coming back and you're willing to take this, then I will concede that all that polycrisis, rec polycrisis recognizes is that we are returning to history. But that doesn't actually, I think, really capture the drama of our current acceleration, of which the war in Ukraine, with all its intensity, is to some extent a foretaste, a relatively familiar domain between relatively familiar antagonists, as terrifying as it is. The real challenge obviously lies in East Asia, both with regard to climate, where again, we should make ourselves no illusions. The West does not drive the energy transition. If there is to be an energy transition, China leads the energy transition. It is responsible by itself for 31% of global emissions in 2021 on the last count. So it is its dynamic that decides the future. We do not hold our own fates in our own hands. From the point of view of the sort of people sitting in this room here, in other words, broadly speaking, as the Chinese say, white faces, this is a huge shock to the historical system. There's never been a moment in which our provincialization, long promised by post-colonial discourse, has been more clear than it is with regard to the climate question. Whatever we do, we do not side the, the outcome. We make a significant contribution. The Chinese need us too. But the driver here is in Beijing, responsible last year for half of all renewable energy investment in the world. 90% of the upstream capacity investment in China. So that too is a dimension on which I think the moment of polycrisis registers maybe the return to history, but a history which is even more radical than the one that was the 20th century. So you mentioned two dimensions which we're, we're kind of um, going uh, off the edge of, of traditional history, the cyclical thing. One is there are more people. Secondly, that the problems are man-made rather than exogenous to us. Um, a third thing which um, uh, which I think is endemic, well, is inherent in the idea of the polycrisis is that the sum of the crises is, is sorry, the, the, what is it? The, the, the sum total is, is the worse total than the sum of the crises. Worse than the sum of its parts yeah. and that they're kind of interplaying with each other. And you've worked brilliantly on a lot of the crises we face, whether it's the financial crisis, the climate crisis, the pandemic. Can you just talk a little bit briefly and then we'll kind of open it up to, to a discussion with the audience about the internet interconnections between these things which make the poly crisis different from just a bunch of different crises that we're, we're dealing with uh, you know in serial uh, manner well i think you can think of it as massive interconnection and an unpredictable interconnection the way in which russia's invasion of ukraine triggers a food crisis in large parts of the world you could think of it as a kind of exposure of underlying tensions. So the huge psychological damage, emotional damage, mental health damage, for instance, that COVID did to many millions, tens of millions of families and relationships around the world, that would be a compounding effect. You could think of tipping point logics, the fear, for instance, that many of us have about state failure, Pakistan, for instance, would be a case in point where you have a massive climate-induced inundation, a destabilized geopolitical region of which we were forcibly reminded this morning, the result, the legacy of our own global war on terror from the West, uh, and compounding and serious financial crisis. You add all of that, and all of a sudden, you have an unmanageable configuration which produces a discontinuity. You can have remarkable induction effects. So Black Lives Matter, I think, is perhaps the most extreme extraordinary instance of this, right, where the killing of a single black man in America, which is actually a fairly routine event in the racialized policing order of the United States, unleashes a reverberation around the world. Um, so these would be, and then there was, of course, compounding in the form of a sort of agency, right? So political entrepreneurship, which then where, where the configuration of structures opens the space for a kind of activity. You could say in the positive sense, if you think of something like uh, the Bridgetown Initiative, which is emerging as a space for empowerment on the part of a group of highly vulnerable small states. But you can also, of course, think of the way in which what I would think of the polycrisis 
polycrisis of the United States. The Americans have a polycrisis discourse, except that it's framed in the form of a national catastrophe. And then you end up with uh, Donald Trump's American carnage inauguration speech. That, I think, would also be a compounding move, right, in the form of a kind of political agency that, in a kind of witchy way, looks at all the components, throws them in a pot, and says, look, if I stir this bubble, bubble, toil and trouble, God knows what will come out, but it's going to be super interesting. <laughs> um, and that is also a kind of political agency enabled by polycrisis, because we all know in how those resonances get established. All of these phrases, all of these ideas, by the way, are ones which were thematized by one of the leading experts on the Chinese side for public security. So at the beginning of my book, Shutdown, I can canvas and compare, in a sense, the American carnage version of polycrisis, the Jean-Claude Juncker, Edgar Morin social theoretic description, and the way in, so, way in which inside the Chinese security bureaucracy, all of those different modes of interconnection are actually thematized as problems for the security state to be attentive towards. Look for induction, the Black Lives Matter effect. Look for breaking points. Look for agency on the part of agitators that will tie together the housing crisis in Hong Kong with the suppression of uh, freedom of speech and some other martyrdom. And all of a sudden, you've got yourself, a pro you've got yourself the umbrella protests. So this polycrisis thing can be viewed both as a social theoretic statement, as an existential crisis, which I think is what the Ukrainians are giving us, uh, but also, as it were, as a rather technocratic, almost matrix for thinking about the governance risks that we face. And we should be conscious, I think, of the mode in which we're engaging with the problem. I think you, you just provided the perfect description for, for where this discussion's going. We've thrown lots of kind of interesting stuff in, in the pot, and I think that um, it's now time to bring in other people and see what, what can come out of it. So I'm going to ask for a bunch of people to come in, and we'll come back to Adam. Um, uh, can, can, yeah, Mike, can you give it to, to Sinan? You see me writing on here. I'm not texting my friend. I'm, I'm just taking notes from the... Sinan Ulgan with Edam in Istanbul and Carnegie Europe. Adam, I want to get your sense about your, the historical perspective on the current technology shock. And let me reframe the, uh, this a bit. The technology optimists would say that the type of technology shock that we have seen throughout history ended up being positive. Yeah, we've been able to overcome the shock of the industrial revolution, electricity, internet. We know how to deal with this. The pessimists do say, however, that this is something different that we have not seen in history. Uh, the impact that the AI revolution combined with robotics, uh, automation, could have would break down the social contract, which is already very fragilized for a host of reasons that also has to do with technology, globalization, trade, but mostly with technology. And therefore, the, the future looks dark in terms of the, you know, whether the democratic social contract could survive under these conditions. Where do you stand on this? Okay, do you want to pass the mic forward to Manuel? Um... Thank you, Manuel Lafont apnoui I'm head of the French MFA policy planning. Uh, so I'm really refraining from asking what's the precedent for such an unprecedented situation. How did we deal when there was no precedent before? But my questions really are, how is democracy uh, a specific dimension to how we survive the polycrisis? Because I don't buy that authoritarian regime deal with the polycrisis better than we do. I nonetheless can see, can imagine that the way we will deal with it is going to be very different. So I'm curious to hear from you on that. And my second qu quick question is, one of the way I understand the polycrisis is that we're stuck in not being able to be strategic if strategy is making choices and having priorities. Um, and how do we do that? We are not organized and we don't know how to be strategic without having priorities. And the minute you take a priority with the polycrisis, you're doomed not only by the other crisis, but also by the fact that all the other adversaries are going to see, say, oh, that's the soft belly is there. We can attack there. Great. Jeremy, do you want to come next? Jeremy Cliff, thanks for that, Adam. Um, I was intrigued by what you said about an, a compounding effect on some solutions as well. You mentioned Bridgetown. I mean, can, can we talk of 
poly solutions with the same degree of hybridity and scale as the crises that you talk about, or is that just wild optimism? Okay. Um, can you pass the, oh yeah, to Anna in the front and then um, pass it towards the back. Thank you. Um, I would like to focus this uh, question. Can democracy survive the poly crisis, particularly in Europe? And what is the big difference? Democracy in Europe is based on the welfare state. The European citizens have uh, as a first priority the welfare state in their country. And now we see that all these crises, I mean, digitalization, climate, demographic uh, change of the world of war, all these issues have a strong impact on the welfare state. And what does it mean that there will be social unrest? And so there is another risk for democracy there. Okay, if people who want to speak can put their hands up. Can you pass it to Ivan Krastev and Anthony over there? And if someone could bring a mic round to this side, there's a gentleman in the fourth row, I think, who's... Thanks, uh, Anthony Dworkin, uh, Senior Policy Fellow at ECFR. So in the Global Order panel this morning, um, there was a strong message coming from the Global South participants that the way to solve these global crises was through cooperation. And um, obviously those of us working in different policy areas are aware of the challenges to cooperation at the moment in an increasingly competitive age. So I'm wondering whether you think the way forward is to try and reestablish some cooperation across the, the divides and how far that'll take us, or do we look for different ways, um, perhaps more competitive solutions to the global crisis? Thanks. Great. And um, thank you very much for your questions. But Adam has a huge brain, but he doesn't need to answer all your questions. So if people want to make statements and talk about the idea of the poly crisis as well as asking questions, that would be wonderful. <laughs> I have a question. Is this not the case with the poly crisis that basically governments don't know what to do, but they should do it very intensively? So from this point of view, the poly crisis creates a kind of contagious activism. Okay, yes. How, how would you like to tackle the good old question of the correlation between money and the democracy in this poly crisis? Thank you. Great. Uh, anyone else want to come in at the stage or should we go back to Adam for, for a bit? Okay. Adam. So, this is great. I think we've succeeded. Right, right. We, 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 that, that was as rapid fire a range of questions as I've seen on the panel in some time. Um, hopeless position from my point of view in trying to answer. Um, at some level, I think, okay, so let me try, one, one set of answers I think is actually quite conventional and quite European, which is to say that faced with an unpredictable and complex set of um, challenges like this, the best bet is to build um, safety nets which are fungible, versatile, complex, and quite comprehensive. And in other words, the welfare state. The welfare state should not be thought of as a liability, an albatross, a mortgage, as the Germans would say, a hypothek, as I think Angela Merkel tended to do, you know, those famous phrases about Europeans are 7% of the world's population and 30% of social spending or something like that. We should say, yes, that's fantastic, and therefore we're better prepared for the poly crisis than anyone else. Look at the way in which, for instance, short-time working functioned as a buffer for Europeans against unemployment, mass unemployment during the COVID crisis. Look at the incredibly stark disparity to the United States, where the labor market churned people into unemployment and then back into it, let alone the informality in much of the emerging market. So I would say double down on those strengths. The difficult bit, is to go then to the fiscal underpinning, the money question, and this just exposes my old bias as a European federalist, big money, big debt kind of a guy. I think Europe was the, one of the progenitors of the modern fiscal state, of the modern nexus between treasuries and central banks. Money's singular function in this context is that it's the easy bit, it's the fungible bit, it's the legally constructed bit. It is the bit which, as Keynes taught us, is the means to affording anything we can, and this is the crucial clincher, actually do. The actually doing, the I'll come on to in just a second, but it is literally the case that we can afford anything we can actually do as sovereign 
states. It, the Europeans enjoy the standing as the issuers of what are essentially reserve currencies and are at no risk of losing that anytime soon, especially when they're up against the currency control Chinese and the Americans. So there's really a huge space there for agency and empowerment along incredibly classic lines of building a powerful fiscally backed welfare state as the platform for securing the population against these unpredictable risks. Where we get into more challenging territory for Europe in the current context, but I think actually for all advanced economies and notably for democracies, is that I think the answer to some of the other challenges is to get on the front foot. In other words, if you basically wait for the polycrisis to come to you, both in structural terms, infrastructural terms, and also in the kind of realm that you explore so brilliantly, Isfan, the kind of, the kind of um, discursive construction of reality terms, you've lost. You have to make realities ahead of time. You have to be moving onto the front push to push. So this is where I would locate the kind of moves massively under-resourced, but definitely heading in the right directions, which were the Marshall Plan, not for, but with Africa. This was the right move, the right answer by Berlin in 2017 to the refugee crisis. That's the right way to go. It needs then to be resourced at one belt, one road levels. In other words, hundreds of billions of euros a year to get us even in the right vicinity. But that is the kind of move that I would be wanting to make. So it is a welfare state. It is the apparatus of the fiscal monetary uh, uh, the, uh, union, and it is investment. Proactive investments of all kinds shape the battlefield. It's the economy stupid. It's well, no, but it's not. It's politics shaping the economy. No, because the economy stupid said there is an economy out there, like Angela Merkel's, you know, globalization uh, uh, teacher, whose homework you have to do. Right? There's an economy that will answer your question. No, we actually have to shape that space. Which the political economy is stupid. It's the political economy stupid. That and and in that, this then goes to the tech component. We have, I think, as terrifying as AI is, we have to be tech optimists. I don't really see that there's any other choice at this point. We have bitten into this apple. We are deep in. Pulling back from that at this stage seems like a surefire. Well, it's an abdication of a historic wager that our culture, our civilization, our society has made hundreds of years ago. And it is being contested, we should not kid ourselves, throughout all the way back to the Luddites and every single technological stage since. But that is, I think, the space we have to be in. And what better demonstration do we need of the force of this than the triumph of the vaccine program globally in 2020, 2021, 2022? There is no reason for a kind of overarching pessimism, but there has to be a sophisticated democratic discourse about how we steer those technologies. So in the end, you know, you end up speaking what is in a quite familiar discourse of a sophisticated democratic politics of investment and of technological change. To me, the real challenge for Europe is scale and speed. It really has, it's banal, but it's actually getting to the pace and the scale that we need to be doing this. We have, I think, the resources, the political structures, the models in the form of the welfare state, but we have not got to shrink from the big numbers. And that's a huge problem. Can I just challenge you a bit? Because it, it, at the beginning, it was all about how this is not, this is new, it, discontinuities, but yet you're reaching for the most kind of classical tools, both on the kind of fiscal side, welfare state. It was a very 20th century kind of models, both in terms of the welfare state and the ways that we become resilient to, to those sorts of shots. But also even what you're saying on technology, you know, feels, you know, if you look at the discourse where people are worried that human agency is kind of forever over and that we're going to be on the, you mm. know, the idea of us driving the technologies rather than the mm. technologies driving us is, is, you know, goes against where the kind of culture's uh, going. But, and, and it was the same also, even on the fiscal side, what you're saying is we need to invest in these things. These are kind of big political projects for which you need a national consensus. But that political base which built the welfare states in the 20th century isn't there anymore. I mean, part of mm -hmm. what we're talking about in the poly crisis is a completely different way of organizing power where a lot of the, the sort of assumptions we had about representative democracy, you know, just feel very difficult to sustain in this new technological age where the, the idea of a kind of demos and all those sorts of things are being kind of challenged by the very technologies that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, on that basis, you would be more pessimistic than I I'm not, no, I was just, I'm just asking questions here. I'm not, no, but I mean, the, the... I just thought there's a disconnect between no, your I analysis, which I, is very much, we're in a kind of new territory, yeah. um, and then your solutions, which are like reassuringly, you know, as a kind of European social democrat, they will seem like great to me, but, but, <laughs> but how do you reconcile that with the world that you're describing? Well, I think that's when we get into um, the politics of, well, so, I mean, I, I completely accept, accept the force of your, accept the force of your critique. Um, in part, I think it's a reflex of the um, scale and urgency of the challenges. I'm not actually certain that we have space for experimentation. Um, and I don't think it's inconceivable that we could, on the basis of the sheer force of the dynamics that were unleashed, many of which also have a 20th century feel, especially if you think about the geopolitics, what after all is China, but the realization of the nation state project of the late 19th century on an absolutely gigantic scale. So maybe at that level, it's not surprising that some of the answers have this rather, I agree, sort of hackneyed feel. I think there are also, um, questions to be asked about what has worked under these circumstances. And if you think of next gen EU as the EU's hitherto greatest, well, it's an escape act, right? I mean, Europe was supposed to fail in 2020, looked as though it was going to through April and then manages not to. And if that is our model of what surviving at the first shock of the poly crisis looks like, then it seems to me it's a combination of the recipes and the formulas that we're already familiar with. I'm not, I'm not confident that that can necessarily be scaled up, but if the question is, what do we currently have in our repertoire that will allow us to do that? That is a fundamental issue. The, that is, sorry, that is, the, that is the road that we, the roadmap that we, that, we, that we have to follow. Where I think, and in conversation with folks that actually have to deliver, for instance, the energy transition, the, the, the debate really gets profoundly difficult, is in relationship to your ability to roll this out at the local level. So can you actually build? So if you take the energy transition as a concrete problem for thinking, or concrete instance for thinking about this problem, the, the, the energy generation is one dimension where we, can, where we appear to be able to move forward because it's a highly concentrated decision. It's at the level of transmission that we run into problems. And that, I don't see there's any answer to this but for continuous work at the local level in building consent, transmission line after transmission line for the steps that are necessary to get us to a sustainable energy system. And I'm aware that that's a kind of floppy, open-ended, incremental answer but I don't know that short of a kind of authoritarian willingness to stamp power down, we within our own system, within our own constitution, within our own value set can possibly have any alternative. We need to streamline, and it's really banal stuff. We need to streamline the procedures so the vetoes are deployed productively rather than in a kind of trench warfare of stopping the changes that are necessary. Okay. Um, I think we can have another round of thing. Can we get a mic at the front here for, for Bruno Machais? And then um, if other people who want to speak could wave their hands about, that would be very helpful. Great. Uh, what strikes me, and may maybe Adam will have some comments, is uh, this uh, end of times psychology that uh, people suddenly start to think that uh, collapse is a solution, that destruction is a solution. Let me give you a few examples, Adam. Uh, we're talking about the outside. Uh, for the US, a Chinese collapse is a solution, maybe the only solution. For China, an American collapse is a solution. For Europe, a Russian collapse is a solution. For Russia, a European collapse is a solution. For climate activists, a collapse of the existing system is a solution. For Brussels, a collapse of Britain as it exists is a solution. For Tories, a collapse of the EU is a solution. And we stopped thinking that there's any kind of solution except to sort of wipe the slate clean. And why, why, why is that? And it's very disturbing, no? But it, it seems to me to be everywhere. Great. Can we can you pass the mic back there, and then if someone could pass the mic to the lady in the pink um, top at the on the edge, that would be great. Yeah, Joanna van der Maver. Um, I'm the manager of innovation, strategy, and policy at uh, Leiden University, but here is a Schmidt Futures uh, International Strategy Forum fellow. Um, so. My whole career has been based on kind of future foresight. I started with the Ministry of Defense, helping them understand 
you know, the impact of AI on the battlefield, does it completely change our military balance of power? Leiden University then asked, okay, can I come and help them prepare the university for the future? And so the term unprecedented is my nightmare. <laughs> and, you know, I think as I've gone through and I've faced many questions of, of the analyses that I did were on historical battles, historical precedents. And I think we need to kind of challenge this term of this overwhelming idea of everything is unprecedented. There are many elements of what we face that are precedented. Yes, China is the biggest that we faced, but so were the previous empires that existed at that time. It's kind of, it's relative. And, you know, with, with, with the military taking them through a very methodical identification of what exactly is the unprecedented, making it small so that it didn't seem overwhelming, and then looking at the precedented to, to show that we have the ability to invest in the precedented parts, the things we know, and then invest in the smaller um, unprecedented. So that's just my challenge on this kind of overwhelming picture that tends to, you know, scare populations. The only one I can't wrap my head around is climate change. That for me is unprecedented and when people ask what keeps me up at night, it's that one, because that one, I think, is the, the one challenge we face that truly has unprecedented circumstances, context, and impact that we don't have tested solutions for. But for a lot of things, we do have tested and tried solutions that we just need to make sure we're reinforcing and not wiping the slate clean of them because they've been proven to work, um, and we have no reason to believe they won't in the future. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple of people there, yeah. Thank you. And if other people want to sort of signal as well while you're, while you're... Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Van Rehnquist. I'm a member of Parliament here in Stockholm. I was thinking about the, the impact of a single crisis has on democracy. It seems like institutions, politicians, parties come together to solve a problem like they did in COVID in ways we didn't think was possible. Whereas in the polar crisis, it seems to be the opposite. Uh, it sort of just creates... Um, an apathetic um, way of looking at democracy. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lolita Sigan from Riga, Latvia. I just wanted to follow up on the question about what is uh, unprecedented and uh, what is precedented. And to also ask a comment from Adam about uh, this uh, expression, political economy is stupid. Haven't we already seen it in 1970s? Haven't we already experienced it? Thank you. Okay, does anyone else want to come in? Yeah, who? Oh, there, okay, yeah. Mark Malik brown uh, Adam, you confess that your solutions are a little bit more anodyne and modest than the scale of the problem, but you're starting with the nation state. The bit that only, the only person with the temerity in this room to ask is me because I'm a creature of it, as to whether the multilateral system is the place to start. It, uh, on the face of it, seems the least promising because it is the most broken, the most failed, the weakest. And yet those are often the reasons why an institution faced with a burning platform problem actually galvanizes itself to take on the crisis in the way that institutions with less of a sense of immediate failure in their future sort of keep going and don't respond to the crisis at scale. Okay, Is anyone else want to come in? All right, Adam, do you want to, to answer? I actually think, Mark, yours is a, is, a, is a suggestion after all that sits squarely in the logic of the Bridgetown agenda, right? That's exactly where they go, in, in part to escape, and I didn't really want to say it out loud, but to, escape, to in part to escape the, the problem of democratic political economy that Mark backed me into. Um, is that what you what you simply say is right? We'll move to institutions where we think we might get the mandate one way or another for a half trillion dollar expansion in balance sheet because we're certainly not going to get that from Congress. So we work the political mechanisms in Washington and get our half trillion dollar expansion that way. And that kind of technological fix, though, it seems again, I mean, that makes up you know in sort of technological nerdiness for its otherwise rather innovative qualities. Um, may also be part of the way in which we answered this crisis. I mean, along with, along with my confessedly um, familiar, not to say conventional answers, also goes a refusal, Bruno, of some of the drama. When I, when I speak about poly, poly crisis, I don't think 
and I don't think anyone else does either who thinks about it seriously, I don't think we should be imagining imminent collapses, erasure, the end of the world. I agree with you that those are, in a way, ways of escaping the problem. They're not actually ways of addressing it. They're ways of unthinking or thinking yourself out of the box. That isn't our, for better or worse, that's not our situation. The UK is not going away. It's just going to sit there broken offshore. The United States is not going to go away, even in the event of a serious meltdown of its constitution. It'll be there, dangerous and broken and present, right? The, the ideas of sort of extinction rebellion, of mass death of humanity as a result of the climate crisis are also clearly fallacious. We're massively adaptive. So this is, a, I think, a diagnosis which is post-Malthusian. It's trying to be non-theological. It's not claiming that there's some final great annihilation that will happen. It is simply that life will become much tougher for hundreds of millions of people. It already is much tougher and will become progressively more and more so. And their efforts to cope with that will become more and more will, will constitute greater and greater struggles. Um, and Pakistan is a case in point, right? So many people around the world are waiting for it to explode. You can literally count the headlines. It isn't going to explode. It's going to remain there as a fundamentally troubled, fundamentally destabilized polity. That then goes to this point that, that you made so well, and I struggle with this as well as a historian. It would be at some level absurd to say everything is radically unprecedented because then we'd have no concepts at all. We'd have no replicability. We wouldn't be able to think. The sort of somewhat, I don't mean to trivialize, but the image that I think of is in terms of Lego bricks. Imagine the world consisting of a large box of Lego bricks. Each one of those Lego bricks has a strong nuggetized logic which is infinitely replicable and can be assembled into bigger and bigger bigger and bigger pictures. But when you say that the biggest picture of all is climate change and that's the one that you can't deal with, well then I push back at you and say, well, you're essentially conceding my point because what after all is driving the climate crisis in the current moment, but amongst other things, the rise of China, which in other respects looks like other moments, except this time around, it's responsible for 30% of global CO2 emissions, which is driving the onset of the crisis. So I think, Rather than let me, so that we don't misunderstand each other, rather than glibly asserting this radical novelty, I come to it in the same way as you do, as somebody who fundamentally finds it puzzling that this should be the case, but I think that is what we have to increasingly grapple with. To wrap things up, because actually we, we should move on to the next phase of, of our discussion, I, I wouldn't disagree that this has echoes of earlier moments of crisis. It isn't, I think, by accident that the diagnosis of polycrisis can be traced also in its intellectual history, back to characters like Gamorin, who can be squarely located in the political economy and the thinking of the 1970s, whether it's the Club of Rome report, whether it's the political economy of inflation in that period, the corporatism, whether you're thinking about the sort of intellectual background that shaped our careers, 1980s sociology, reflexive sociology, Ulrich Beck, Anthony Giddens. I think this state of the world, which is in which the reality, if you like, the natural reality of economy is muddied by politics in a constitutive way all the way down, that is the inheritance of the mixed economy of the post-war period, and it is one that we've inhabited for a half century. It's just that to, to go back to my response to the, our colleague from Leiden, we are dealing with a moment at which quantity tips into quality, in which the accumulation of essentially familiar components building to the scale that we currently inhabit up against the sort of environmental limits which we now recognize as real creates a qualitatively new situation. Does that condemn us to passivity? No, at some level, perhaps you could read the conventionalism my answers as saying we have no excuse for not acting at these levels, because at the very least we know these answers really ought to help. They may not be the be all and the end all. They may not be the innovative special source that we think we need. They may not be terribly exciting for young people. They may not therefore necessarily work in a social media inspired world, but at the institutional and structural level, there aren't a lot of better bets out there than the resources of states anchored in things like social insurance, technology policy, and large-scale public investment. Fantastic. Um, so maybe we can all thank Adam for giving us such a, an extraordinary deep dive into the poly crisis. And, um, and at ECFR, we, we don't just deal in, in crises, um, which is why we're meeting here in, in Stockholm, which still has three weeks left of, uh, of its presidency of the, the European Union. 
uh, which we hope will deliver us a, a poly solution. So um, I'm going to hand over to Carl Bilt, who is going to introduce our last speaker for the day. We're very uh, grateful to have not just one, but two people who've been Prime Minister of, uh, of Sweden in our midst to, to lead us. Into well, not two, only one who has been and one who is. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to be Mark. You have, you, have, you, have, you have to be fairly careful with that. Uh, 